So the final uh, panel, I think, and probably the most interesting possibly is criticism of indigenous artists of the Americas. You do not see a lot of um, criticism. And Marina Tainko, who's Chamorro, um, she is moderating this panel. She is a curatorial assistant in the Department of Contemporary Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. She's based in Providence, Rhode Island. Previously, she taught an introduction to indigenous art at Brown University. She is a scholar of global indigenous art and a doctoral candidate at the University of Pittsburgh. Her dissertation examines embodiment as a strategy of four contemporary indigenous artists. So thank you so much, Marina and panelists. Thank you, America. So before I introduce the speakers, I just want to um, share a little bit about what we're doing today. So a crucial part of the art ecosystem, art criticism is a temporal response to art and a source for future thinkers. This roundtable attempts to demystify critique and criticism of indigenous art of the Americas. We will discuss what makes one an art critic, why we need art criticism, and what critic criticism looks like within our communities, and then um, have some time to talk about the challenges facing emerging critics of color, particularly indigenous curators um, and critics with ties to their communities. So on the panel today, we have um, someone joining us via um, text and uh, emails. Rosemary Diaz from Santa Clara Pueblo is an anthologized poet and an award-winning writer based in Santa Fe. She studied literature and its respective arts at the Institute of American Indian Arts, Europa University, and the University of California, Santa Fe. Nadia Jakinski Seti, PhD, um, sorry, Nadia, is a Lutique and an art historian and museum consultant based in Alaska. She's a program director for the Journey to What Matters, Increased Alaska Native and Culture Program at the CIRI Foundation and an occasional art history instructor, including serving as a 2021 spring quarter Native knowledge lecturer in art history at the University of Washington. And finally, Stacy Pratt, also a PhD, Muskogee, is the staff writer for an international music nonprofit, a book reviewer, a musician, and an art writer specializing in indigenous art and literature of the Americas. She formerly taught Native American literature and other courses at SUNY Jefferson in Watertown, New York. She is now based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So thank you both so much for joining us today. I'm so excited for our conversation. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in and direct this question to Nadia and then Stacy, um, if you'd like to respond. So I think that this is something we've all thought about. Um, I also write for First American Art Magazine. I write art reviews. So this question is also something that um, is important to me. So why do you write American Indian indigenous art? Why do you write about indigenous um, art of the Americas generally? Yeah. Thank you, Marina. So it's really wonderful to be here. And um, I'm so inspired by all the discussions that have happened so far, but I really appreciated what um, Dr. Aton, Heather Aton was telling us yesterday about love. And um, a lot of my writing does come from this, this sense of love for Alaska Native art and uh, the arts of the North. And I feel like I'm a very strong believer in the power of arts to kind of inspire us and to share our stories and also to connect generations past, present, and future. And so when I'm writing about indigenous arts, I wanna be able to share the beauty that I see through the stories that are expressed in our arts. And um, I know that as indigenous art writers, we're all probably very aware that our arts have tended to be defined by and written about from the outside. So it feels like there's this incredible opportunity to record local art histories and to fill in some of the gaps that have existed in our recorded knowledge by being involved in writing um, indigenous art history. Um, so it, particularly as an Alaskan, I wanna be able to draw attention to the art that we're making up here because Alaska takes up such a huge swath of the map and uh, we're extremely diverse, but we're not always included in the art histories that are told about the Americas and we're not always represented accurately. So I wanna be able to write stories that help to create a sense of visibility about what's being made up here in the North. And I feel like it's a really important opportunity to be able to explore um, and challenge misrepresentations that have happened about us. And then something else that I think a lot about when I'm writing is um, I'm a mother and I have three little girls and it's really important to me that um, 
our Alaska Native culture and all Indigenous cultures really are written about and shared in a positive light. And this is something that I see as very important, especially because so much of um, Native American histories uh, tend to be written about in a really negative way in the media. So um, I think it's important to be able to share uplifting and positive stories and um, really create an opportunity to just share the beauty of what we make in our cultures. So that, that really inspires me and in writing about the places that I love and what I see that is beautiful around me and helping to create a record so that that will be there for the future and for my children. And so um, as we move forward in the world, we, we are really grounded in knowing the beauty that we come from and being able to share that with everywhere else in the world. Um, so I think I'll just, yeah, that, that's where I come from. Great, thank you so much, Nadia. That was beautiful. And I think um, we're all very inspired from the panelists yesterday. Stacy, do you wanna say why you write about indigenous art? Yeah, because I do, like I said, I came from a literature background, but my family, and so my, all my degrees are in English. And my family, I, I came from a family of artists. Most of the women in my family are visual artists, textile artists. I'm the one who's not, there, there are very few of us who are not, and I'm one, and I'm a writer. And so growing up, I was surrounded by indigenous art, the creation of it, and you know, going to fashion shows, and going to art shows, and going to art markets, just going to, just art was everywhere. It didn't even seem like, I, I just assumed everybody had art in their life. I didn't realize it wasn't in everybody's life in that way. And even um, on a, even not a formal artist, there was still just art. Everyone could bead, everyone could carve, everybody, you know, people who don't consider themselves artists in air quotes artists in that sense, were still doing art. And so I just grew up that way. Well, when I was in graduate school, I read Craig Womack's book that I just talked about, Red on Red, and he talked about the importance of having, he was talking about literature, but he was talking about having our own literature that's about us, for us as well, because so often as indigenous writers, we're, we're explaining ourselves to outsiders um, always, as, as opposed to being able to just lay back and write for our uh, audience, we expect to understand us. So I was coming from that with literature and I was at the Northeastern State University Symposium on the American Indian in Tahlequah and I saw America speak. And this is when First American Art Magazine had first come out. And this just a thousand light bulbs went off over my head. And I thought, why? Cause she was saying we need more writers on art. And I'd never thought of that being my part in the art world because I just said, well, I'm not an artist. So I don't, I'm not part of this. But I suddenly thought I'm a writer and I grew up around this and I do know a lot of it and maybe so. So I started to, I knew I couldn't do it right then because I was, you know, teaching full time in a community college in New York and my husband was deploying, it was the war. But I started to give myself some more background knowledge knowing that I wanted to do that and be part of what she was building. And, you know, as I saw that, then I learned about other things that other people were doing and and it just gives me a connection to my community and to my family even. And it's something that I feel is so important um, because our indigenous art is a way that we're, we're often ignored, but indigenous art is something that the rest of the world does see, does like, and does misinterpret. So I think that it's really important that we're here, like Nadia said, to, to um, present it as scholars and as writers of all kinds because the words are going to, unfortunately, in a way, sometimes the words on art are the things that, that are respected by the people in power. So we need to be there for them. Definitely. I think that that's such a great thought to think about, you know, speaking to, um, scroll to just the audience that might only read non-Native people, non-Indigenous people, not that they can't write about Indigenous art of the Americas, but just that there's a different sense of perspectives. You know, as America said, I'm tomorrow. I don't write about tomorrow art or culture, but it influences the way that I think about long histories and the way that you uh, I approach art as a very loving gesture, as Nadia said. So thank you guys for those really great responses. Um, I'm going to um, now read a question that was shared by Rosemary, and I'm also going to read her response. So excuse me, I'm gonna be talking for about a paragraph, um, but then I'd love for you both to respond. And this is something that I uh, think about differently because as someone who has, you know, is getting my PhD in art history, I, I don't really think that's what you need to do to write. 
um, about art by any means. Um, and I think that there's so much interesting writing that isn't coming from people with credentials. So I'm kind of leading the cart before the horse to say that what are the credentials to be a critic of indigenous art of the Americas? This is Rosemary's question. And she says, I do think credentials to write about American Indian indigenous art should be based on a more human connection, emotional, spiritual, sensorial to the work than on a formal study of the Indian and his art in quotations. Um, and she says she's using 70s wording, which sounds silly today, to illustrate the limitations and inherent gender bias in this kind of happening um, that's still happening in scholarship. In the same light, academic achievements are certainly not to be discounted, but encouraged, celebrated, and added to the box of tools we might find useful in our efforts to dismantle the old structures and systems of confinement that have long attempted to wrest the self from the American Indian indigenous self-expression. And so the big question here is just who is qualified or credentialed to write about American Indian and indigenous art? Um, who is, you know, whose words should be listened to? And I think that Stacy kind of already spoke to this question about like who, about finding your way into writing about art. But Nadia, do you have a response to this? Well, I guess I would, uh, I, I think this is a, it's a beautiful question. Um, and, and personally, I don't think it matters if you have a PhD. I don't think it matters at all. I think that when you have a PhD, it does give you a little bit of power because you might suddenly get invited to something that you might not otherwise um, have an invitation to. So it kind of gives you a seat at the table, um, which, is, which is absolutely important. But I think, um, to be a critic of native art, you need to have a really thorough understanding of history. You need to understand indigenous um, value systems and our worldviews. I think you need to understand our land claims, uh, the history of representation. Um, you need to have really great observation skills to be able to look closely and um, with all of your senses. I think that's absolutely important. Um, I think you need a huge sense of curiosity too. Uh, to be able to question what you see and why you're seeing what you see and where you're, where you were trained to look in a particular way and why that matters. Um, when I am taking on criticism of Native arts, I ask a lot of questions and I ask, um, I ask the people around me what they see and why they're seeing what they see. Um, I also try to think about what are the what are the stories that are being told here and why does it why does it matter who's telling this story and um, how could it be done differently. Um, but absolutely being a critic of native art, you need to be someone who is constantly learning and uh, questioning where your own knowledge comes from. Um, it's absolutely a pleasure to be able to dig really deeply into a work of art and to look at as many angles as you can to try to explore what an artist is telling you through his or her work. Um, but I don't think you need a PhD to do it. <laughs> do you want to add to that, Stacey? Or? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I happen to have a PhD. And you're right, it does open some doors that wouldn't be open. And it's a huge responsibility to be a person with a doctorate, to be an indigenous person with a doctorate, because you are speaking for you, unintentionally, whether you mean to or not, a lot of people are going to see you speaking for all indigenous people or all your tribe, you know, and that's not the case, but you do find yourself in these situations and you just have to always, you know, I mean, as a person, as Creek people, we're always taught that we're always um, speaking for our ancestors and our descendants and we're just this, we're, we're a piece of that at all times. And as a scholar, as a writer, you're that too. So, but I don't, this was such a hard question. We had talked about it before as a panel and I was like, how am I gonna answer this? But I agree, you don't have to have a doctorate. And in a way, sometimes it almost hinders you because a doctorate can make you really scared. The way that you learn and the way that your brain changes, if you are working right now on a master's degree and you feel like your brain is broken and never coming back, just hang in there because you eventually recover. But it, it was, it's hard on you when you come from your community and, and a way of thinking and a way of engaging with the world and with art, and in my case, literature, that you have to learn how to speak their, their language, the language of the academy. And it almost hurts sometimes, um, the, the, not a disconnect, but a, they ask you to have a distance between yourself and your, your community that 
you don't want. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I always wanted to write about British literature. And one reason people would say, why don't you write about native literature? Why don't you write about native literature? And one reason was because I didn't want to be a scholar of my community. I just wanted to be a member of my community and a scholar of somebody else. And I, as, as you were speaking, I thought about when I was a young freshman in college and I, I wanted to do British literature because it's so different and so, uh, so to me, so foreign. And I love that about it. And my professor was British and I said, a lot of times as a native person, I don't like when non-native people write about us, but do British people mind if we do? And she was like, nobody's ever even thought to ask me that before, but no, we don't mind. That I approach it the same way. Um, I want to take, you know, and even I, the, when I write about people that aren't Creek, you know, aren't my tribe, like Nadia said, you have to be so respectful, so curious and and willing to be curious and to kind of make some scary mistakes in etiquette. You know, I know that my tribe has a lot of etiquette rules and so I assume others do too. And in interviewing you tread around those. Um, but I think being willing to do that makes, you, I guess anybody can be a critic, but to be a good one and to be one that's gonna be valued by those communities, I think you have to come with that curiosity and respect and willingness to see a wide view I wanted to hear a little bit more about what you were saying about the responsibility that comes with um, doing art criticism and maybe if you could you just elaborate a little bit on that and what that what that means to you exactly. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't unmute all of a sudden either. Not sure what's going on. Um, so uh, the responsibility of being an art critic and you know, it's scary to say to call myself an art critic. You know, I'm an English major. I mean, I'm still getting over being an English major. But uh, we even America had said that it's, it's some, the first time you call or someone calls you an art critic, you feel like really? There is a lot of responsibility because that term, even art critic, comes with so much connotation of these very important people probably in New York. You know, <laughs> they're not going to be in Adair County, Oklahoma. I mean, I'm not either anymore, but you know, there, there's this, a connotation of an art critic is somebody well-respected, somebody that has all the knowledge. You, it feels like you have to have a depth of knowledge that I honestly do not have. You know, there are a lot of mediums I don't know about. There are a lot of tribes I don't know about, a lot of nations I don't know about. And I'm still going to come to their art and write about it. I'm going to gonna do the best I can. But there is a responsibility because, and I keep saying this, but every time we write something, we're creating art history and we're creating the archive for the future. And we're also creating the conversation for right now. And so that's a big responsibility because, you know, and, we, and I mean, this sounds really not arrogant, but bigger than I mean it. We're kind of guiding thought about, we're, we're guiding what people see. We're turning people's heads to, to what they're gonna see. And that's a big responsibility that we're taking on, but it's something that, you know, after watching Dr. Aton and Dr. Mythlo talk, I'm very fired up about it. Like we have to do it though, even if we mess up because it is our responsibility. And I didn't see that as a young scholar. I was just like, I don't wanna write about native things. It's, I, that's my life. I wanna do something different until I got out in the world and saw that some of the things I took for granted aren't things that everybody knows and are some of the ways that we go about the world and see the world aren't the ways that other people do. And until I went out, out of my community, I didn't really get that even though I'm a reader, you know, it, I still didn't get it. And I think that's the responsibility is um, being, you know, guiding the, you know, guiding the, t the t microscope <laughs> for people um, is a huge responsibility, whether you have a doctorate or whether you're, you don't, but anytime you do art criticism, you're in that position. Wow, thanks so much for that. Um, I think that responsibility is something that uh, I hear basically every indigenous scholar or like writer um, think about and relate to. And I really don't ever hear it from my non-native peers, um, mm -hmm. thinking about responsibility in that way of like responsibility to specific people, not to an idea of what you're supposed to do. So I really appreciate that. Um, question from Nadia and answer from Stacy. So um, just to kind of pivot back to the like art criticism as topic, um, Nadia mentioned something that I think about a lot as a as something that I 
appreciate when I'm approaching exhibitions and that's curiosity. So I think that curiosity might be something that we, and open-mindedness um, for lack of a better term of just really trying to take in an exhibition um, and an installation in this really open way to understand it and, and kind of meet it where it's where it is. Um, so I would say that curi curiosity is probably an essential component of art criticism. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts about what other essential components of art criticism there are. I have to say that when I write, I don't think about like a list of things that I'm doing. Um, funny enough to America's question, because I also do curatorial work, I always think about layout and lighting. Mm -hmm. And those are things that I can't take out of um, the way that I approach an exhibition and text and the way that they're all laid out. Um, but I, I don't think that I'm like, oh, I need to make sure that I write about X, Y, and Z in that criticism. But I, I would love to hear what you think are the essential components when you're writing about an exhibition. So what are those things that you think need to be there um, besides maybe uh, an open-mindedness, curiosity, um, intentionality, I think, to understand the work? Um, I would say that uh, you, I always want to make it personal to me. So when I go to an exhibit, I always think about how does this relate to my family or to my culture or to my community? How do my children see this? So I, I often think about how it relates to me. And um, obviously having a formal analysis is really important in your art criticism, I think. What, what are you actually seeing? Um, and I think, uh, what do we see? Why do we see it? Um, how are things being positioned so that they're in conversation with each other uh, is something that I like to look at. It, when I'm exploring an exhibition, there's a lot of analysis going on and interpreting and evaluating. And I also like to look at what's happening around the exhibit. So how do I contextualize what the exhibit is showing within um, a larger context of what I see happening in my community or in the place where an exhibit is taking place. So I think that an art critic shares historical context, but also frames it within this larger um, cultural uh, understanding of what's happening in the world. And maybe a, a good example is the most recent um, art exhibition that I was reviewing was about um, women of the North. And um, it was at the Anchorage Museum. It's called Extra Tough Women of the North. And it's an absolutely incredibly beautiful exhibit. And um, it could be framed at looking at how, um, how Indigenous women are being presented more broadly uh, right now in exhibitions around the world. Um, but I also really appreciate all of the activities that are happening with this exhibit with um, really great curated conversations around the topic of women and um, uh, cinema that's happening in relation to women. And so I like to look at everything that's happening around the exhibit when I'm writing about it. How about you, Stacy? I am the same. And am I, am I not muted? I'm okay. Um, I am the exact same. When America said, people, you can tell people who don't have art history degrees because they write about everything but the art. And I was like, she's talking about me. Um, but I agree. I feel like the context of the exhibit, of the exhibition is important to me. And to me, it is important as what I talked about creating the archive because what's going on around it is part of how people are going to see the art and how they're going to interpret the art and how they're going to feel it. I'm thinking particularly of writing about ex exhibitions that are on, um, oh, she said, I, I, she's America saying, no, that's not what I said. I have to see what she said. She said, oh, she said, she said, I didn't say without art history degrees. She said with other, she said with other degrees. She didn't say without an art history degree. She said who, people who come from other disciplines is what she said. Um, but I, I definitely come from another discipline and I definitely um, write about all the things that aren't the art, but I'm going to be hyper conscious of it now. But I think it does sometimes matter because I'm thinking of these um, exhibitions that were, you know, the first time people opened up after COVID and what it is to go into say installation now that we can't touch things with some of the art that's meant to be touched. And so some of that does matter. And um, now I've gotten all, oh, how do we come to it? So that's part of what I do too. I look at, I, I come to it as, as where it is in history and where, it, and the location to me does kind of matter, like what museum it is. Seeing an ex exhibition of Muskogee art in the Seminole Nation Museum versus say in a 
non-native museum would is a different to me a different experience a different context so that that is part of what i can consider and the lighting you know what the curator was doing because i worked uh, with curators on gallery texts and i'm not a curator but i've learned a little bit about the things they have to consider um then but the but the art is the thing the art's the reason we're there you know and i look at at what stands out to me particularly you know when you go in there's always something you're immediately drawn to what and why is that and is it just me or is it generally something that we're all drawn to and how the arts um art pieces connect to each other what they're how they speak with each other as a conversation as a whole um i'm thinking yeah, because I don't ever think I don't think about the process. I just kind of do it. And it's it was a little scary for me the first time I reviewed an ex exhibition. It's one of the first things I wrote for America, actually. And it was in Santa Fe. And yeah, it, it was I, I've definitely had the who do you think you are feeling. Um, but I definitely think that you know, we're not there to judge quality exactly. But at the same time, we do you know, um, what art, because what art gets chosen and what art gets ex ex exhibited does make a difference and it, it's gonna make a difference to the seriousness with which indigenous art is taken. And so it is something we have to consider and, and talk about feeling like I have no business judging that, but it is something we have to learn about and be able to look for. And I hate being the one to say that, but I think it's true. Great. Uh, well, thank you both so much for that. Let's. So, um, I think that as there's a lot of people in the symposium and also probably on who are panelists and also viewing it, um, who are artists, I think that this is a really interesting kind of way to pivot to the idea of art critique versus art criticism. And I know that um, in our introductory conversation, Stacy, because of your background in writing and also your kind of knowing about um, art through your family, it being kind of always something that was part of your life. I wonder if maybe you can start us off on what you think the difference is between art critique and art criticism. Is. Well, you said it even, because <laughs> I, I said I, I almost started talking about it, but I stopped myself. I never do that. Um, so, you know, critique has to do more, I think, with what, yeah, let me start with critique and then I'll get to criticism. Critique has to do, I, I think of it more as what an artist and an artist would do amongst themselves. Um, or an art artist and a mentor, um, looking at the piece and talking about what could be, how they're interpreting something, how that could be brought out more. I'm thinking of it in terms of, you know, I, I did, I've, I've done a lot of writing workshops because I'm a creative writer, I'm a poet. And in a critique session, other writers will look at your piece and and talk about what they're getting out of it and why, and whether it's working in the way that, you, you find out whether it's, conveying what you meant to convey, basically. And so I think critique has more to do with that and the, whereas criticism has to do with placing it in context. So we're not, even though I just said that about quality, we're not there to judge on quality. We are there to judge on context and um, what place it it uh, occupies in, in, its, in its, uh, its exhibition, if it's a particular piece, or in the context of indigenous art or American art or however we're looking at it. Whereas I, I feel like critique has more to do with the success of, of, a, of a particular piece. Would that say, Nadia, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think you've absolutely answered that. And um, I don't know that I think about the distinction very much either. I tend, I tend not to use labels to describe what I'm doing if it's, criticism or critique or art history or um, so I don't know I don't know that I've thought about it too much <laughs> how about you Marina um, I think it is certainly food for thought because uh, I haven't done like an art critique since I was in high school um, because I haven't made art since then basically so I think that there's this way that I think about like um, Stacy really lovely um, put it in such a lovely way about the kind of what you'd say what your mentor would say to you what you'd say to your peers about how to improve something. And I do have to say that I think that quality does come into it because often the exhibitions that I reviewed um, because of my geographic location on the East Coast were in New York um, or in kind of major cities. 
in which case the artists that kind of the, the native um, American indigenous artists that get to have those kinds of exhibitions tend to be um, pretty well respected um, within the field and kind of outside of it. So I think that there is, and not that they're the, the like best artists overall, but they tend to be artists who have kind of demonstrated quality in what you um, might say to the broader art world, like names that people would know and would expect like a certain level of quality for someone who doesn't know about Native art. Um, so I, I thought that I should just maybe mention that because I think that it's something that like comes into play with the work that I have written about. Um, at this point, since we have about uh, 25 minutes left, I wanted to make sure that I gave some time to read um, Rosemary's statement uh, that she shared with us that um, just answered some of the questions. And then I think will lead us really beautifully into an issue that um, you've both kind of started to touch on, but I think that um, there's much more to say about is kind of how you take your specific um, knowledge as a you know, tomorrow person or an Alutique person or a Creek woman and what that and what impact that has onto your work. So I'm going to, again, um, read for a little bit and then we can start our conversation again. Um, so this is again from Rosemary Diaz. I write about American Indian and indigenous art because I have a strong connection to my American Indian indigenous ancestry and culture. I want to be part of preserving the Indian story and propelling it into truer Indian fact-based narrative. It's a matter of wanting to be responsive to the art being made by people in my extended Indian community with whom I share points of reference. Often that includes writing about the art people create, created by people I know and care about, even love. Writing about Indian art is a way to expand the universal or at least the familiar and or tribal art dialogue, which is the structural foundation for the grand rewrite of indigenous history authored by indigenous people. For me, there is no value in coming at another's work in question of its validity or with a rigid set of standards by which to analyze its aesthetics, value, or importance or measure its Indianness. This disallows for a deeper reading of the work in question and pushes away the emotional response while engaging a more superficial one that is concerned only with technical aspects of the work or how it is being presented. Though important, lightning, lighting, not lightning, lighting display and other physical components of formal art exhibition are not really my main focus when writing about indigenous art. Instead, I let the work register on an internal level, let it settle into my gut, my cells. I refer to memory, the Wikipedia of my life, both inherent and of this time and place, to find connections to what I'm processing. In some ways, I think it's my responsibility as an American Indian indigenous writer to offer critique on work that is of such origin. Therein exists a partnering of energies that are interdependent in their pursuit of harnessing a more thorough understanding of this living, breathing, ever-changing thing we have named art. So then um, kind of moving to the question that I raised, um, this is about critique within and among um, her community. So critique within and by my Indian family was delivered with a lot less sparing of the art maker's feelings. I remember my grandmother teaching my cousins and me how to make small bowls and animal figures from clay. If our coils weren't stacking up just so, or our shapes were lopsided or hastily crafted, she would take the clay from our hands smash it back into a ball and hand it back to us to start again. Those lessons were not soon forgotten. You definitely did not want to be scolded more than once for the same infraction. That may seem a bit harsh on the outside, but such rigid instruction was a matter of practicality, wasting clay that took weeks, sometimes months to harvest, and the process was a waste of precious resources, including time and energy, and taking pride in your work. It's your family that you're representing out there, and your work has to say, I care about that. Those are very beautiful words. So thank you, Rosemary, if you're out there listening. And I, oh, I guess I would just also jump in and say, um, I, I really appreciate that discussion about um, materials and the preciousness of the materials, because I, I, I do think that for me, um, looking at the materials of the artists that I see use is something that really draws me in as well and really inspires a lot of the writing that I do. Um, with this sense that so many materials are absolutely precious. And I'm thinking about cedar bark and moose hides and fish skins or spruce roots. And a lot of that is about that process and 
how you work a hide or how you gather from the land and all of the subsistence that happens around the materials that are used in our arts. And so I think when you have that as part of your heritage and your background, if it's for me and I'm writing about fish skin, for example, um, my relationship with fish, eating it, sharing salmon with my family and harvesting it and watching a salmon swim in a river or just being able to know the feeling of a fish's scales on my skin and the way that those scales sparkle if they catch the light um, and all that labor that goes into pulling up a net, this, this really informs how I see something that's made out of that material. And um, it, in, it impacts the way that I write about it. And uh, so I, I really appreciate that Rosemary is talking about that as well. So I think you get a different emotional response to a work of art when you when you have a deep connection with the materials that the artists are using. I absolutely agree with that, especially because I come from where the red clay is. And so, you know, we would dig the red clay and I'm not a potter by any means, but I, but I know what it feels like and I know what it smells like. I know what it feels like in your feet even because, you know, my yard had it. And so when I see that, that just literally came from the land, literally came from the land you live on and, and is shaped into something intentionally. Yeah, you feel differently about something like that. Or to watch my aunt weave, she's a, she's a finger weaver and knowing what that entails and to watch my mother paint, you know, my mother's an abstract painter. And so growing up, she would, I would just watch her and there would just be this stuff going on that looked like, like just colors and paint and it smell, there's a smell of it that is in your whole house and your whole childhood is that smell. And then she'd make one line and it would turn into what it was meant to be. And just that moment. So when I see art, I know that that moment happened for that piece, no matter what it is and no matter what um, medium. Because I, like you said, I grew, like Nadia said, I grew up surrounding it with the materials, with the actions, and with the people who prioritize it. You know, growing up in a household with a family full of artists, having a mess on your table is normal, you know? <laughs> and going into my relatives' houses and seeing a half finished painting or a half finished quilt or, you know, a mannequin that's wearing something that's still being pinned together, um, a weaving that's still tied to the back of a chair, you know? you just when you see the finished product in an exhibition then you know what went into that and it's respect to to write about it and you're writing about the end product but you're writing in your mind like Nadia said you remember all of that 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 got got it to that piece but there's a lot I mean not just making the art but get it making the art and being willing to take it out in public because we have a lot of artists who hang their painting in their house and hang their painting in their family's house and that's where it hangs you know, it, it doesn't always go out. We, you know, I have uncles who are, who have done carvings and done leather work and nobody's going to see that. It's, it's on horses and it's, you know, on canes that are in, that are how in the house or maybe used our deacons canes at our church, you know, that's, that's art, but it's not in a museum. And so what we're seeing went through a lot to get from where it is to where we're seeing it. And as critics, I think as, as reviewers and critics, we have to keep that in mind. I think we do as indigenous people, like Nadia said, maybe in a different way than others might, or or when we're working with our own art. You know, I, I have got to stop talking. Make me stop talking, mute me. <laughs> okay, one more thing I'm stopping. I have not reviewed an exhibition that was not an indigenous exhibition. And I feel like I need to do that as an indigenous person to see what I'm like as a critic when it's not something that has this relationship to my life. So I'll stop there. <laughs> So that's a great kind of thought um, to chew on, I think, for maybe um, Nadia as well. Um, but I really appreciate the, the idea of the, the, I think what they would say in like, from part of my art historical training, that the process of making something and mm -hmm. then just kind of to get to these materials, they have gone through so many stages that there's not, um, I think the, the kind of parallel in non-native art is maybe like in, within the craft world, right? Where you're thinking about, or what has been called craft. Um, I think that we don't, it's not really a useful category, but to think about people who really make things and make all the materials involved in making things, there aren't a lot of parallels to that. Um, and I also think that it's really important to remember, as Stacy pointed out, that so much um, art isn't made for public consumption. And it isn't made for people like us or just any anyone who's writing for First American Art to review. 
um, but there's still a great value in that, um, perhaps more so because it has meaning to the community that has, you know, it is making something for you for the use of your family. And I think that that's something that is a really um, significant piece of Indigenous Art of the Americas that I want to remember and hold on to and think about when you're seeing something. It's, it's you know, some of it has been made for a museum, but it might be related to things that are just made for, you know, your aunts or your cousins or your uncles or whoever the um, gender non-binary non person that is making this thing, like that it has these deeper relationships within community. Um, so that was a really roundabout way of kind of leading us into our next question, which in, again is something that Stacy brought um, out in our conversation, but I think Nadia, I'm sure we'll have plenty of thoughts on, which is how do um, existing relationships factor into how you approach art criticism? Mm. So this is, I think something that's also been alluded to in other um, sessions, but just thinking about, you know, there are so many connections between people within communities. It's, you know, like everyone, I think, I'm not sure who said it, but I think someone said like everyone's related or um, related to other people. It's like that when I'm on Guam, um, but not really in the, you know, in the US proper. So um, Stacey, do you wanna take that? Yeah, that's scary. Somebody, <laughs> that's the scariest part. I, who was it in the last panel who said the, the editor of all time are your aunts and your, your own aunts and uncles and your family when they come in and, and the docents. Um, but it's true, just there, anytime you write, you know, you're especially, cause we do all know each other, you know, <laughs> like that's not, a, that's a stereotype, but it's a little bit true, you know, be, thanks to um, native, thanks to being big giant Creek communities in our case, but also the boarding school situation in the urbanization program, they, they meant to crush us and they just created bonds. So now, you know, if I'm not kin to you, you probably went to school with my aunt at Shilako, you know, it's everybody knows each other and it does make a difference because you, you know, you're not just going to write the review and then go away and never see these people. You're probably going to see them in a week. I mean, not now that it's a pandemic, but <laughs> when it's not, you're going to run into these people and what you say better have been respectful. And I like, we keep coming back to Dr. Aton talking about a good critique is love, edit good editing is love. And the same thing about what we do. It, you want to be honest because to not be is to be disrespectful. You know, to say the nice, not, not I don't mean nice, I mean, of course, we're always nice. We're always professional. We're not just there to be rude. We're not that kind of critics, but the way that you say something, you have to be precise about it, but you have to say the truth, even if you're gonna run into that person, but you have to say it in a way that you know is gonna um, not just tear people down or or discourage them. We don't want that. And um, it also makes a difference in what we can write. So the first time, that I was going to write for, well, not the first time, but one of the first times I was writing a review of a catalog for America, I said, is it okay that my mother, like my family are good friends with this person? And she said like, yeah, in Native American art, we're, that's just gonna be the case a lot of the time. You know, in the rest of the world, I'm gonna have to say if I'm, you know, good friends with people, but here it's almost, almost expected. I mean, to find a stranger is gonna be a lot harder here <laughs> and that makes it makes you have yet another level of responsibility but I think in a good way because you also have support you oh, know, I, you have, I'm sorry okay I was just going to jump in there and say I absolutely agree um, that we're all so connected in our communities that there's a lot of responsibility when we're writing about um, our own family members or about the people who are in our community. So there's this huge level of trust, I think, and vulnerability also when we're when we're writing about the people that are within our own communities. Um, so indigenous art criticism is necessarily about working with care because it's going to be shared back out to our community members and we want to represent our communities in the brightest light possible. Um, so it's, it's about truth telling, but also being very gentle. And I think it's also about making sure that the artists that we see know that we recognize them and we see what they're doing. Um, and that we, for me anyways, there, there is so much generosity in the arts community that I, I want the artists that I appreciate 
and that I admire to know that I care about them and I want to be able to help them be seen outside of our communities as well. So I feel like um, this whole sense of just making the statement, I see you, I recognize what you're doing is really important. Um, and just keeping track of each other is something that we do within our communities. And uh, yeah, it comes back to that question of love again, when we can, when we can write about uh, the artists that we know and care about and um, share that to the outside world, we are helping their careers um, move beyond the local context. And I think that's really important. Um, and that can propel them very far within the field of um, Native American art. Maybe it'll help them be seen by a larger museum who that might want to collect their work. Um, so we're, we're helping to move artists, hopefully, forward into other communities where they might not be seen by sharing what they do through our writing. Yeah, I agree with that so much. And it's so it's such an honor to be part of art in this way. I mean, as a non-artist, it is so such an honor to even have anything to do with it. And I hope the artists feel that from my interactions with them. And we, but we do have it different. I'm thinking about being at the, at the Santa Fe Indian market and I did an interview with this artist and then he was a young um, Muskogee artist. And I was like, do you need help carrying your chairs <laughs> back to your place? Cause he was taking down his booth. And so I'd helped him. And then my family was, my aunts came over like, have you eaten? They were going, oh my gosh, this wouldn't happen in the regular <laughs> world, <laughs> but it does happen in ours and I love it. It's so much, I mean, I think that it, when you emphasize things like love and care and, you know, humanizing even people like, any that you are having this relationship with that's like limited about like critiquing their work. I think that that's, I think that can only be positive um, because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to let those, um, that that's gonna detract from you uh, doing all that wonderful analysis and interpretation that Nadia suggested, right? Um, and th there are ways to be critical and also caring um, just kind of generally. Uh, so I see Jamie and I think it might be getting close to time for Q&A. Um, so we still have, I kind of organized our whole session as questions, um, but I'd love to just maybe squeeze one more in if that's okay, Jamie. And also I don't think I thanked America and First American Art Magazine initially, so I just want to make sure that I do that. Um, it's been so wonderful to be here and to be share space with these fabulous um, women and men, women. Um, so I think that I should just probably end on this great question. I think um, Nadia also brought up um, in America and I think we've all thought about, but why do we need art criticism? Go ahead. <laughs> or do well, you <laughs> go, go ahead, Stacey, about, and then I'll, I'll go ahead after you. <laughs> and I'll try to be succinct. I promise I write more succinct than I speak. Um, so why do we need art criticism? Some people say we don't, and I get it. I really do. You know, artists that are like, ah, oh, we don't need that. We just need the art and the artist here. And I really get it. I'm a poet, and sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes I feel, and you know, especially when I was in graduate school and seeing this literature that had changed my life, this literature that to me was almost a faith, you know, that I love so much, these words that were my soul. And then you read the first deconstructionist criticism of it and go, what, why, why are you treating it this way? We don't want to bludgeon it, you know, in that way. But I think it is important. It's fun, as uh, I think Andrea Ferber said, <laughs> part of it is it's fun. And, and it's a way to have a conversation. And I think if we're not having conversations and serious conversation, I, I mean, all, seri all conversation about art is serious in its way, but I think, having these conversations is necessary because the conversations get the art to more people. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, I hate to be the crass person that says this, but they sometimes our criticism and our conversation, our particular published conversations get the art to people that have the funds and the resources to get the art to more people. And that's really what this particular kind of art we're talking about. You know, I just talked about something like a deacon's cane that's meant just for my community, but some art is meant to find its person that for whom it's going to be life-changing. And to get this indigenous art out into the world, I think criticism 
it is an archive of thought. It's an archive of native people's thought in our case, when we write about our own art, but it's also a way to, like, it, like Nadia said, get it out in the world to who it needs to be with, just practically. As someone who writes academically often um, because of my PhD, be an and a more um, automatic response to exciting art that's being made, that's being shown, even if it's a historical show, like even if it's not something that is contemporary, which it tends to be what I write about, I think that there is a, a need for, um, as you both had mentioned, some kind of archive for it. And I think that art criticism can be that kind of first um, archive. And I also just think that it makes you a better writer to not have to write academically. Uh, I wish that I had heard <laughs> um, Dr. Niflo's talk, you know, when I was starting my PhD, but I think that it's so useful to hear now and to also think about that not everyone wants to read um, the way that the Academy wants to read, as Stacy has put it, and it's such a blessing to be able to think about and to articulate complex thoughts um, about something that is interesting and worthy of complicated thoughts in a way that is accessible, and I think that it's so, so necessary for the field. Yeah. And it, it creates argument, makes people argue, and arguments get attention. So that I mean that's not always the case, but sometimes it is. And even the arguments that are that are caused by art criticism can be really valuable because they can take you to the next level. You know, I've been called out by things I've written, and at the first I was like, I'm so embarrassed. But then it made me think about that thing that I was called out for, and we're putting ourselves out in the world. It's a, it's a little dangerous too. I mean, <laughs> because because now it's out there, but um, yeah, and uh, it's not my turn, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I guess I would just add that I think it's absolutely critical that we have art criticism coming from so many diverse voices. Um, so I love seeing how many um, new authors are being shared in First American Art Magazine. And I think it's an absolutely amazing place to be able to showcase the work of emerging um, authors, and I, I really applaud um, the magazine for making space for um, just creating this platform to be able to showcase all of the incredible artists and um, arts that are happening across North America. So it's, it's an absolutely amazing resource that um, I don't, I, I kind of, I appreciate your comment, Marina, that you were making about um, not always wanting to do academic writing, because I, I think this is really important as well. I want to be able to write in a way that if my grandma picked up what I was writing or somebody who is just a member of the community, somebody that I might have worked with if I'm doing, if I'm going to visit a small village in Alaska and if I can hand them what I've written that they can pick it up and read it and understand it and it makes them happy. Um, I want to be able to reach that audience. I think that's, uh, to me, that's more important, honestly, than being able to reach an academic audience. I want my community members to be able to uh, pick it up and read it and care. So um, I really appreciate First American Art Magazine for making space for this kind of writing. I think it's absolutely critical. So thank you. <laughs>